Okay, so apart from joking, this, uh, you might notice the title of the paper is uh, different from what you have on the program. Nevertheless, uh, the, the, theme, the theme of the paper is the same. And it's basically trying to understand the role that fiscal policy plays in inflation determination and sovereign crisis and default in uh, a small open economy. So I don't need to convince this audience that uh, for many uh, a small size open economy to keep an, a stable nominal exchange rate is a target of primary importance. At the same time, we understand that this requires some level of coordination between the monetary and uh, uh, fiscal authorities. So in recent years, there's been also a revival of interest in the role that monetary fiscal policy interaction can play in understanding key moments of US macroeconomic history. So the goal of this paper is basically bring some of the lessons that we learned for the uh, US macroeconomy uh, in the context of the small open economy. So in particular, what I want to do is to build a model that delivers a series of key insights. So first of all, I want to have an explicit link between the lack of fiscal discipline and inflation. I want to examine the role of monetary fiscal policy interaction in the case of a crisis that stems from a lack of fiscal discipline and how particularly a conflict between the two authorities can result in very bad dynamics. And finally, I want to introduce the notion of uh, cosmetic default. So this idea that in this context, uh, a default is not really going to help. A default is just going to postpone uh, the problem. And, uh, and then I want to apply these lessons to the uh, Chilean experience. So in particular, what we're going to do is to model interaction between the monetary and the fiscal authorities in present of default and changes in the level of spending. So the framework is based on Gali and Monacelli, and like in a recent contribution by Krivoluski, Mueller, and Wolf, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the Gali and Monacelli backbone and combine it with the possibility of default and, and changes in the monetary fiscal policy mix in a way similar to what I've done in some previous contribution with my co-authors for the US economy. So something I want really to uh, pay attention to is the possibility of lack of coordination between the two authorities. And these are basically insights that come out from this uh, previous work I did for the US. And but with respect to these papers, there are a couple of important changes that are important to understand the results that, that will follow. First of all, I'm going to argue that deviations from fiscal discipline do not happen randomly, but they are generally associated with the high level of spending. Then a sovereign crisis uh, and uh, defaults are recurrent events in this context. And finally, I'm going to introduce the notion of cosmetic default. So this, what is a cosmetic default here? It's a default that lowers the current fiscal burden without addressing the underlying fiscal issue. So the model shows a series of, uh, of key results. So in particular, it shows the perils of the lack of monetary fiscal policy coordination. So if the fiscal authority deviates from uh, uh, fiscal discipline and the monetary authority remains committed to exchange rate targeting or more in general inflation stabilization, you can get into uh, a sovereign debt crisis with uh, um, uh, an acceleration of debt accumulation and stagflation dynamics. The sovereign debt crisis uh, uh, cannot be resolved by a default. So the reason why is because as a fiscal measure, so you lower the current fiscal burden, but you're not really changing the, the root of the problem. The possibility of the fiscal authority deviating from fiscal discipline in the future is always a drag on the economy. And so this means that if you have high levels of spending and agents are not confident that in the future you will be able to implement the necessary fiscal adjustments, you incur output losses today. And this suggests that there could be a crisis even due to a lack of confidence in future policymakers' behavior. So there's a very vast literature when it comes to open macro. And there is a very vast literature when it comes to monetary fiscal policy interaction. I'm not going to be able to cover all the papers. I'm just citing the ones that are mostly related to my work. And I want to just emphasize two of them. They are Marcet and Nicolini and Sergeant, Sergeant William St. Jean, because they introduced this notion of cosmetic monetary reform. What is the cosmetic monetary reform? It's a monetary reform in which in, in, introduces, say, exchange rate targeting or fixed exchange rates without addressing the, the root of the inflation that is fiscal policy. So I borrow the terminology cosmetic and I apply to default to show that something similar happens uh, with default. So in the interest of time, let me jump straight to the backbone of the model. So think about uh, a small size Mucanesian model like in, uh, uh, in uh, Calvo, sorry, sorry, in uh, uh, Gali Monacelli. And uh, so what you get uh, is like you have represented the house and maximize utility firms that face sticky prices. And what you get as a, as a solution, you have a linearized Euler equation, or IS curve, in which output today depends on expected output and the uh, realized real interest rate. 
uh, sorry, and the actual real interest rate. Then you have an occasion augmented Phillips curve with inflation that depends on expected inflation and the level of real activity, YT. And given that in this model, it's a very, you know, very basic model, we have the assumption of complete markets, you have a tight relation between real activity and real exchange rates. Now, this model would conclude just uh, with a Taylor rule. Instead, here what we are going to do, we want to specify explicitly the behavior of the monetary and fiscal authorities, as opposed to just to focus on the behavior of the monetary authority. So that means I'm going to uh, write down the linearized uh, government budget constraints. This says that uh, uh, the debt to GP ratio today depends uh, on the realized real interest rate uh, default. That generally is going to be zero most of the time, but if it happens, that it's going to lower the current debt to GP ratio. It depends negatively on growth. It depends on the previous debt to GP ratio. It depends negatively on taxation and depends positively on the level of spending. So the fiscal rule is going to be the simplest fiscal rule I can think about. So the taxation level reacts to the debt to GDP ratio in the previous period. And everything here is written in terms of GDP. The monetary rule is also very basic. In a sense, you have the standard Taylor rule uh, framework in which uh, uh, you have the response of the nominal interest rate to inflation or the exchange rate, depending on what you want to do, inflation targeting or exchange rate targeting. What is important is that given that there is the possibility of, the def of default, uh, the nominal interest rate, the, the sovereign yield, is going to be equal to the risk-free rate and the expected size of the default. Okay, so before get jumping into introducing policy uncertainty, let me spend a few minutes discussing why we care about the fiscal rule. I feel like everybody understands why we care about the monetary policy rule in this class of models. It's sometimes a bit less clear why we also care about the fiscal rule. So when it comes to the monetary policy rule, we know that if the central bank satisfies the Taylor principle in the sense the response to inflation is more than one to one, or in this case of open economy, if there is a positive response to the nominal exchange rate, we get the Taylor principle satisfied, uh, we get determinacy, everybody's happy, okay? So the, uh, we get macroeconomic stability around uh, the um, desired inflation target. If the central bank deviates from the Taylor principle, then we sometimes refer this as passive monetary policy, we get indeterminacy, we get uh, uh, multiple equilibrium. So that's my column on the right over there. So in all these papers, at some point, there is a sentence that says, and the fiscal authority moves a lump sum tax in order to stabilize uh, debt. Now, that sentence, uh, that very simple sentence, is essentially a parameter restriction on what the, the fiscal authority is supposed to do. To, so to see this, let's take my fiscal rule and let's replace it in my linearized uh, budget constraint. What you see is that now the debt to GP ratio depends on the previous uh, uh, debt to GP ratio according to a coefficient that is equal to 1 over beta minus delta B, where delta B is the response of taxation to the level of, uh, of debt. So what this says, essentially, is that in order to have a fiscal uh, uh, stability, you want this uh, uh, root here of the autoregressive process to be less than one. Why is that? Well, because in that case, the debt to GP ratio is mean reverting. What that implies for the fiscal authority is that delta B, the reaction to, the previous, uh, to that in the previous period, needs to be larger than one over beta minus one. Okay, so sometimes we refer to this uh, situation as passive fiscal policy, meaning that the fiscal authority is passively accommodating the behavior of the monetary authority. Like we are learning painfully uh, these days, uh, it's not written in stone that this has to happen, okay? So then what we are interested in in this uh, paper is what happens if the fiscal authority moves away from this uh, passive fiscal policy. So what happens if we move in the left column? So suppose that the fiscal authority refuses or is unable to implement the necessary fiscal adjustments. So in this case, we can distinguish two cases. If the monetary authority remains committed to inflation targeting or exchange rate targeting, we get no solution. And we get no solution essentially because nobody's taking care of uh, debt stabilization. If instead that the monetary authority accommodates the behavior of the fiscal authority and lets uh, inflation move in order to stabilize debt, we get determinacy, but it's a determinacy, it's a unique solution with very different properties in which inflation now is used to stabilize debt. Now all of these, was discussed under the assumption that there are no regime changes. As you see, I removed my uh, Xi-P variable that before was indexing uh, the response uh, uh, of uh, inflation, uh, the, of the federal funds rate to inflation, sorry, of the monetary policy interest rate to inflation and exchange rate, and the response of taxation to debt. So this is what happens if you have fixed coefficients. So if this situation persists forever, 
What we are going to do in this paper, we're going to allow for the possibility that there is a conflict between the two authorities, but this conflict is just temporary. So what is going to happen in this context is that we can allow for temporary explosive dynamics uh, and uh, nevertheless get a solution to the model because this situation is eventually going to be resolved uh, uh, for good or bad, okay? What is the role of default in all of this? So right now, this is, the, I just described you the standard framework, not default. What happens if I introduce default? So I wanna start putting up front uh, the notion that default in this model in itself uh, is not costly, okay? So this is based on a paper by uh, Uribe or some years ago. So default here uh, acts uh, as simply as a change in a sense in the timing of taxation. So if the government decides not to repay uh, the, uh, the current debt to GP ratio, essentially uh, agents anticipate that they will have less taxation in the future and a sort of Ricardian equivalence applies. You might say this is a really not a desirable feature of a model with default, but in a sense it's something that I like for the point I'm trying to make in this paper. So I wanna show that even if default in itself is not costly, its interaction with the monetary fiscal policy mix makes it costly. And the reason why is because default is still going to contribute to the acceleration in debt accumulation that occurs during crisis. So essentially, if agents anticipate there could be a default in the future, the, the, the sovereign spread goes up and debt accelerates uh, its accumulation process. So of course we could easily modify the model also to have an explicit cost of default and that would make uh, again the, the, the uh, relevance of the monetary fiscal policy interaction even larger because at that point if default is costly, uh, uh, in itself, uh, policymakers would try to avoid at any cost. But the point I want to make here, and it's written here at the very, uh, at the very bottom, is that even if I start with a model with uh, no cost coming from default, uh, through its interaction with the monetary fiscal policy mix, uh, I'm going to get some interesting predictions. Okay, so now we are ready to introduce this uh, policy uncertainty and, uh, and you know, lack of fiscal discipline. So how am I going to approach this? I'm going again to keep the model as simple as possible. I'm going to have uh, uh, only changes in the low frequency components of spending. So in, uh, think about what is the long term component of spending over time. I'm going to model it as uh, regime changes. Sometimes we are in the low state, sometimes we are in the high state. When spending is low, there, is not, there are basically no incentives to deviate from fiscal discipline. Uh, and so we assume that with spending uh, on the low state, uh, policymakers always follow what I call this exchange rate targeting regime. And uh, what, uh, what this gives us is that the fiscal authority stabilizes debt, is in charge of stabilizing debt, and the monetary authority targets the exchange rate. If you prefer inflation targeting regime, the insights of the model would go through even in, in, uh, in that case. When spending is high, on the other hand, uh, there might be some uh, political dynamics that make it hard to sustain high level of taxation. So we assume that when spending is high, there is a pro positive probability that the fiscal authority stops stabilizing debt and we move to what I call the sovereign debt crisis regime. So this is a situation in which the central bank is still committed to keep uh, uh, the nominal exchange rate stable, but the fiscal authority is not doing its part of the job. It's not basically guarantee the debt is going to be on a stable path. So this cannot persist forever. This is exactly a situation of conflict of, uh, in the language of this literature, active-active uh, policy combination described a moment ago. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, if the situation is only temporary, we can still get uh, uh, a solution. So, okay, so what are the possible outcomes of this conflict between the two authorities? So the first possible outcome is that the monetary authority gives up, gives up and we move to what I call a fiscally-led regime. Inflation is now used to stabilize uh, uh, debt, and, uh, and so the exchange rate targeting uh, is, uh, is abandoned. The second outcome is that a default occurs, okay? But this is a default of a particular kind, that that's what I call a cosmetic default. The current debt to GDP ratio moves back to the, its own steady state, but without change in uh, the conduct of monetary and fiscal policy. So what that means is that the policy rules in place have not changed. The, and finally, the third outcome is, you know, the, the trivial one, the fiscal authority can simply, at some point, revert back uh, to uh, fiscal discipline and we go back to our exchange rate targeting regime, okay? So, let's jump uh, to, oh, sorry, before that, let me briefly explain how I calibrate this model. So, whenever possible, I use uh, parameters from the Chilean economy. When it's not possible, I use parameters that, uh, that I estimated for the U.S. economy, okay? So here, in this uh, table at the top, uh, you have all the four policy regimes I discussed. The first column is a dummy variable that says if default occurs or not. Second column is the response to the exchange rate. Third column, response to inflation. 
fourth column is uh, the, the activity of the, of the fiscal authority. So it, under exchange rate targeting, as you can see, there is no default. We react positively to the nominal exchange rate. The fiscal authority stabilizes that. When we enter a crisis, the, the, the important change is that the fiscal authority stops stabilizing debt. So you see the coefficient moves from 0 0.07 to 0. Uh, and as I was saying, this is a temporary situation that has to come to an end. So if we enter default, the dummy variable for default is 1. But as you can see, policymakers' behavior has not changed. And finally, if policymakers decide that they want to abandon the exchange rate targeting altogether and move to a fiscally-led policy mix, we have that now the response to the nominal exchange rate is zero. We have a positive response to inflation, but does not satisfy the Taylor principle. And the fiscal authority uh, keeps uh, uh, the, the coefficient on uh, 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 fiscal stability equal to zero. OK, and all of this is controlled by a transition matrix uh, that gives us the probability of moving across regimes. Asians understand in this model when, low, that when spending is low, there is no risk of moving away from fiscal discipline. But when spending is high, their risk materializes. OK? OK, so let's jump now to the uh, main result of the paper. So as, uh, in the previous discussion, if I had to pick a figure for the paper, it would be this one. OK? So it's good that it's the first one. Uh, so what is the blue line here? This is, the blue line is my benchmark model. And I'm going to consider the following simulation. In period three, we move from low spending to high spending under the exchange rate targeting regime. In period 20, the fiscal authority stops stabilizing debt. So it moves from uh, uh, passive, monetary, passive fiscal policy to active fiscal policy. In period 40, we have a default. But after that, we go back to this uh, crisis regime. OK, so let's see what happens. So when there is the increase in spending, you can see there is a, a slight decline in output because Asians anticipate what, it, what could be coming next. But the important action occurs in, starting from period 20 when uh, the fiscal authority st stops stabilizing debt. In the moment the fiscal authority moves away from fiscal discipline, agents revise upward their expectations about the, the possibility that in the future the fiscal authority be will become the leading authority and inflation will be used uh, to stabilize that. And so what this implies is an increase in inflation expectations that materializes today with a big jump uh, in inflation. Now, a big jump in inflation, of course, means the devaluation of the nominal exchange rate. The monetary authority is committed to keep the nominal exchange rate on target, so it increases the policy rate. And because of nominal rigidities here, the real interest rate goes up, the economy enters a recession. Now, the interesting thing is that the recession is getting worse and worse over time. So you can see that not only output is declining, but at some point it starts declining with an, acceleration, uh, uh, with an accelerating path. What is happening here? Well, the large recession combined with an increase in the sovereign spread gives us an, an, an increase in the debt to GDP ratio. So essentially what's happening is that agents realize that debt might be inflated away. As debt keeps accumulating, this uh, concern becomes more and more relevant. So the inflationary pressure becomes more and more relevant. And the central bank keeps uh, trying to push inflation down. And the recession gets worse and worse. Okay? Now, you might see that when default occurs, the debt to GP ratio all of the sudden moves from the high value back to the steady state. Okay? We make the extreme assumption that you can basically default all the way back to the steady state. This gives a partial relief to the economy because, again, uh, um, uh, default here in itself is not costly. But you can see that relief is very short lasting. The output shows this inverse U shape. So what's happening is that the default didn't really address uh, the underlying problem of uh, lack of fiscal discipline. So the gov government spending is still too high with respect to the level of taxation, and, and, and debt to GDP ratio immediately starts increasing again. And you have basically this twin uh, <coughs> sovereign crisis. So in this sense, the default here is just cosmetic. It doesn't really solve the problem. It just lowers the current fiscal burden without addressing the uh, expected fiscal burden that derives from future expanding and future taxation. Uh, now, you might say, OK, uh, then what is uh, the role of default? Let's dig a bit more into this. Uh, let me consider an alternative uh, economy that I call the only default uh, economy, in which, uh, in case of conflict between the two authorities, the only thing that happens uh, is that the economy is going into default. There is no possibility of moving to this fiscally-led policy mix. So you can see in the, in the second panel here in the first row that in that case, output is flat. So this, again, reflects the fact that default is not costly in this model when considered in isolation. What instead default does, it gives us this increase in the sovereign spread here 
in, uh, in the second column, uh, second row. The increase in the sovereign spread, of course, leads to an acceleration in the accumulation of debt. Now, let's reverse the analysis. Let's assume that the only thing that can, can happen is that we move to the fiscally led policy mix. So that's the orange line in my simulation. So you can see that if that's the only possible outcome, we still get a large recession, but this is smaller than when I also had the fault. So the difference between my orange line and my blue line is the, if you want, the hidden cost of the fault. The fault, by increasing sovereign spreads, contributes to the debt to, to debt to GDP acceleration, and so contributes to generating a large recession. Okay, this is if a conflict between the two authorities actually materialize. So the question is like, what happens if instead uh, we are during regular times, the spending moves high to low, but we don't enter a conflict between the two authorities? Well, because Asians are aware of the possibility that once spending is high, uh, the, the fiscal authority will deviate from fiscal discipline, we still get uh, cost from uh, lack of fiscal discipline. So as you can see, it, it, when spending moves from low to high in period 10 here, the economy uh, also enters a recession. So Asians understand that once spending is high, the probability of moving away from fiscal discipline is higher, and this represents a drag on the economy. Again, we have an increase in inflation because Asians revise upward the, the, the expectations about an exit from fiscal discipline that gives a devaluation, an increase in the policy rate, the economy enters a recession. What about uh, low spending? Well, even under low spending, you can see once we move back to low spending in, in period 40, the economy recovers because the inflationary pressure declines and so the central bank doesn't have these uh, incentives to, uh, to keep interest rates very high. But you can see that the economy doesn't go in the positive territory. In fact, it stabilizes on something just below trend. The reason why is because in this model, the effects of fiscal inflation are very asymmetric. Fiscal inflation is just a drag on the economy. In a sense, it's never beneficial because it occurs only when spending is high. So you don't get the symmetric behavior of inflation and the economy always stabilizes below trend. So this suggests that if uh, Asians' beliefs are so powerful re during regular times, it also suggests that you might easily end up in a crisis simply by a revisions in Asians' expectations. So suppose that because of some policy uncertainty, Asians, uh, even if policymakers' behavior today has not changed, Asians uh, all of a sudden become convinced they might change in the future. So I call this a confidence crisis. So the only thing I'm changing here with respect to my benchmark model, that would be the blue line, is that now, instead of changing policymakers' behavior, I simply change agents' beliefs about future policymakers' behavior. So you can see that even if the, the, uh, the only thing happening is a, is a change in agents' beliefs about future policymakers' behavior, we still get a very sizable recession. So this is, as a, um, helps me convey an important message that the main mechanism at work in this paper is not, very, is not so much what the government is doing in this particular quarter or in this particular year, but is what is the fiscal, long-run fiscal sustainability of what the government is doing. Okay? So it also helps me in emphasizing that I'm not saying that the government should never increase the spending. It, it can definitely do so to, to smooth out the business cycle, and that's why I'm focusing on the low-frequency component, on the trend component of spending in this paper. Finally, I also was interested in understanding when is that default instead would be a solution to the problem. Uh, well, remember what I told you, the default, what it does, it lowers the existing uh, fiscal uh, uh, burden, but it doesn't really change the future fiscal burden. So intuitively, default is going to be a solution to the problem. Of course, we already discussed that it might have other costs, but it's in the context of this model, it's going to be a solution to the problem if the problem is purely backward looking. So what is the typical case I, I could think of uh, in, in this case? I, I, to me, the, a military conflict uh, is a typical case in which you might have a very large debt accumulation, and so you might inherit a very large stock of debt from the past, uh, but without any particular implications on your future um, uh, fiscal policy behavior. And so here I have a, a simple simulation in which I assume that the economy starts with a large stock of debt. It keeps accumulating debt uh, for, uh, for 20 periods, for 20 quarters, because the fiscal authority refuses to stabilize uh, debt, saying this is not my responsibility, it's uh, the result of uh, an external event. And then once the fault occurs in this case, the debt to GDP ratio moves back to the steady state, and you can see we don't get this twin recession dynamics because the fiscal issue, again, was purely backward looking. It was the result of a, a, a past event that doesn't, in a sense, is not systemic. It doesn't have to do with the, uh, the behavior of the fiscal authority period by period. Okay, so I promised that I wanted to apply the lessons of this model to uh, the Chilean experience. So 
I start with a very ambitious plan of doing a, a fully structured estimation of uh, uh, the Chilean economy, and, uh, and uh, eventually I really hit uh, a wall. And, and this is for two reasons. Part of it is because it's not equally easy to get uh, data on the Chilean economy, and in particular to understand how much is uh, how much of that is internally owned and how much is externally owned and so on. And the second reason is also because admittedly the model is a bit stylized. So you would need some additional ingredients to really bring it to the data. So I think this is an interesting venue for future research. Uh, but I was not able to actually get it done for this conference. So instead what I did, I, I, I basically uh, used, let's say, a narrative approach, if you want. So this, what I'm plotting here, this is the GDP growth, inflation primary deficit to GDP and depreciation rate for, uh, for Chile. For inflation, I have uh, the blue line to be the inflation over the whole period. And then for the post-1980 periods, I also have uh, just inflation over the post-1980 periods with the scale on the right axis. Because otherwise, you wouldn't be able to really see anything happening in inflation post-1980 because the scale is so different. OK, so I, uh, so I think that we can think that there are four uh, key moments in uh, Chilean economic history. So the first one that goes from 1960 to 1973, it's a period during which the, the, the Chilean, uh, uh, Chilean administrations were really trying hard to stabilize inflation. Now, what is really interesting about this period is that they understood very early on that inflation had a fiscal nature. So there was no problem in understanding what the root, uh, what the cause of inflation was. There was more of a problem in actually finding the solution, actually putting into place the solution. So between 1960 and 1973, <coughs> we have a series of uh, uh, large primary deficits that you can see here that deliver high inflation. And uh, with the land administration in, uh, in 1973, we have this uh, massive increase in the primary deficit to GDP ratio. And like uh, you know, the model would predict, this came with a, a large devaluation of, uh, of the peso, hyperinflation, and interestingly, it also came, like the model would predict, with a contraction in real activity. Now, I wanna be humble here. So this is a very simple model. There are many things that were happening in Chile at that time, uh, very severe political conflict. So I don't wanna say that all the cost of output come from monetary fiscal policy interaction. That would be a little bit uh, uh, pretentious. But what I want to say is that at least qualitatively, the model moves, uh, it goes in the right direction in creating this link between inflation and, uh, and fiscal policy, and also in creating this uh, possibility of stagflation in the macroeconomic dynamics. Uh, after, so the second period is the one that goes from 74 to 1981. Uh, so uh, General Pinochet took power from President Allende and uh, implemented conservative fiscal policy. So immediately, uh, he moved away from these very large primary deficits. And at the same time, the monetary policy moved gradually, first with the exchange rate targeting, and then eventually with a fixed exchange rate with respect to uh, the US dollar. And as, uh, again, the model would, su uh, would suggest that this came with uh, the end of hyperinflation, okay? And uh, of course, uh, uh, no large depreciations with respect to the, the dollar anymore. But notice that the process was very gradual. So uh, Pinochet immediately implemented a, a cut in primary uh, deficits, but the decline in inflation was gradual. And this is, again, consistent with the fact that what is most important in this class of models is Asians' beliefs. Uh, he was able to immediately implement certain fiscal policies. That, that didn't mean that immediately agents revised their expectations about future fiscal policy. Now, this, the combination of uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy, conservative fiscal policy and uh, exchange rate targeting and, and fixed exchange rates delivered on the goal of cutting inflation. But as the previous uh, uh, talk uh, already suggested, a fixed exchange rate uh, in effect, uh, is even stronger than exchange rate targeting that uh, what I have in my model really represents a little bit of a constraint on, uh, for, for a small open economy. And in particular, well, uh, as everybody knows, an important international change occurred in the early 80s. So, and this is my third period. The US economy moved from uh, what I call a fiscally led policy mix to a monetary led policy mix. It moved from very low, sometimes negative real interest rates to very high real interest rates because it basically wanted to put an end to inflation. In the moment you have your monetary policy tied to US monetary policy, you basically import this uh, uh, monetary policy change. And this caused an important banking crisis uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the end of the exchange rate targeting regime. So now what is interesting about this period is that the fiscal, the, uh, the fiscal authority took on its shoulders the burden of uh, the banking crisis. Okay, so there was all, in a sense, all, essentially all the debt was acquired by the uh, Chilean government. And what is interesting from my point of view is that uh, 
the Chilean, I mean, the Pinochet administration was very forceful in rejecting the possibility of default. So in, in my mind, it's as if they had a, a notion that default is really not a solution when it comes to fiscal discipline. You, you, can, you can solve your problems for a few quarters, but the, your problems are just going to be more severe in, uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in the next year, okay? So they definitely moved away from a, a cosmetic default, and instead what they did, they implemented very uh, uh, strict uh, fiscal policy, okay? So this is the period post-1980, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and as you can see, this was initially successful in bringing inflation down until we get to 1990. So what happens in 1989, 1990, this is the moment that there are two big changes, of course, central bank acquires independence, but most importantly, the country goes back to democracy. And so as you can see, when the country goes back to democracy, you have again a spike uh, in inflation. Now, there are many things happening, this model is stylized. One possible interpretation is that policy uncertainty about what return to democracy meant for fiscal policy had some inflationary pressure. Instead, the new administrations after the return to democracy basically kept going on with the conservative fiscal policy. So, and, and this led to the conquest of Chilean inflation. Okay? So the period starting from the return to democracy and central bank in independence in 1989 to these days saw a, a, a persistent decline in inflation. And uh, again, the decline was uh, gradual, and like, and like Professor Kao was suggesting, perhaps uh, the central bank had to build credibility. Okay, to, for the low and stable inflation. But what I want to emphasize is that the central bank independence is not the only thing that happened here. So I think that this, uh, when we think about the conquest of Chilean inflation, and for me, it's also when we think about the conquest of US inflation, it's a combination of between monetary and fiscal policy. And in particular, the other important change that uh, came later on after the Asian crisis was the introduction of uh, a fiscal rule and of course inflation targeting that is a more flexible mechanism than, than uh, exchange rate targeting. Why was the fiscal rule important? Again, the fiscal rule is uh, successful in dividing two very distinct problems. One problem is I wanna be able to stabilize the economy in the short run. Another problem is long run fiscal sustainability. A fiscal rule exactly delivers on this. It gives you the flexibility of uh, increased spending during bad times while well, at the same time you, uh, you are committed to generate enough surpluses during good times to repay the debt that you have accumulated. Okay, so I'm basically done. So what I, I, I did in, in this paper is to study the consequences of the lack of coordination between the monetary and the fiscal authorities, and then I try to apply the insights of this model to the Chilean experience. So for a small open economy, keeping uh, inflation low, keeping exchange rates stable, the two things are in fact uh, uh, interconnected, is, incre is incredibly important. And the key insight here is that if the fiscal policy is not on board, it's not only that the, the monetary authority might be unable to achieve this goal, but in fact trying to achieve this goal might backfire. You might end up with this stagflation dynamics in which inflation, not only you're not able to bring inflation down, but in fact inflation is exploding in your face, and the fiscal problem is becoming more and more severe. So this is a bit different than saying that you need uh, monetary fiscal policy coordination to keep inflation stable. This is actually bringing it to the next level, that is to say that if you don't have it, you might end up in this uh, uh, very dire uh, situation. What I think is a key insight of this paper, and uh, you know, I, I, I felt I learned a lot by working on this paper, is that a, a default in this context is just cosmetic. It's really not going to solve the problem. You can have a decline in the debt to GDP ratio today, but if you do not address the root of the uh, sovereign crisis or the root of fiscal inflation, you are going to get, end up in an even worse situation a few quarters down the road. Uh, then the other important insight is that even when uh, you are away from uh, a fiscal crisis, you might want to uh, be able to communicate uh, clearly about what you would do if uh, exceptional events were to occur because the possibility of a, a lack of fiscal discipline in the future always uh, represents a drag on the economy, okay? And so here, this suggests that you, not only you wanna keep your, uh, your fiscal policy in order, but you also want to be able to uh, have a plan, a contingent plan for the different situations that might arise. And this is because in, in this context, uh, confidence, Asians' confidence in, uh, in monetary, in fiscal discipline uh, is actually uh, key. Thank you. Thank you.